Awesome, great to be here. It would be great if uh, people aren't on their phones unless they're catching Pokemon. But uh, after this conversation ends, I promise I'll put a Lure module up so you can catch them. Uh, for now, though, we're going to have a really cool casual conversation at Casual Connect. Uh, I want to start with Christian here. Christian, uh, you guys just started playing around with UA. And I know the Ketchup Brothers are pretty uh, interesting guys, and uh, they haven't really considered or, or weren't necessarily the most pro regarding user acquisition. So tell us about the, the journey you guys have taken and where you're at now. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, for those of you if you don't know, Ketchup, um, we're a games publisher. Uh, we've made a few games, like 2048. Um, and then after that, the games did well. We decided to publish our own games. Um, so Antoine and Michelle, uh, they're incredibly talented and, and, and smart uh, co-founders. Um, they got you know to 500 million installs uh, completely organically without doing any paid user acquisition. So if you think about that, you know from their perspective, they really thought that you know there's really no need to to spend money to do UA if we were doing so well without it. Um, I had been friends with with Antoine and Michelle, you know since they launched 2048, and I'd always kind of give them a hard time for not doing UA. Um, and just until recently, they said, "Well, you know what? Let's let's give it a try." But uh, we we want you know we want someone really good to do it uh, that we can trust. So then they asked me to join the company, and, and so I started working with them on on user acquisition. Um, and so just actually just recently, we started running our first ever UA campaigns with uh, with Bungle. Um, and uh, so so far, I think you know it's it's we're we're dipping our toes in, um, and it's. Uh, it's working out well for us, and we want to continue to explore it and, and try it um, and and make it a more meaningful part of our business. You guys have like 150 plus titles. How on earth are you going to do UA for so many different titles when, you know, we'll go with Alessandra in a few moments, but my assumption is if you just have a few key apps, you can build some deep, deep expertise and go all in. With so many apps and so many deals you guys are closing, how, how are you going to handle all that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, so right now, the the basic strategy that we've all decided to do is kind of start slow on some of our larger franchises that uh, can help build our brand, um, and uh, start slow from there. And then, as we start to come in with newer titles, start making bets on which titles we want to um, invest in from a user acquisition perspective. Uh, we have a few titles in the in the market now that. Have done you know significantly well over the last six months. So Stack is one of them. Um, it was it was number one in the App Store for for a long time. So that's one of the titles that we're investing in today. Um, and in the future, th there will be more titles uh, that we want to invest in. We, we just started doing catch up sports, so we're doing sports games. This is a new vertical for us. Um, so that will be one area that we invest uh, user acquisition in. The, the catch up story is fascinating, and I guarantee for every catch up brother or every catch up, right? There's like a hundred thousand of the developers that don't make it out there. When when we started Vungo in the early days, it would drive me crazy when I'd ask developers, "What is your marketing strategy?" And, and guess what you'd hear? Getting featured by Apple, which is not a strategy at all. Uh, and you know, here we are, fast forward today, and user acquisition is now essential. And uh, on, on your side, you've got a, a few key apps. Um, you've seen the industry evolve. You were at Zeusk before. What, 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 what have you seen change, and you know, what are the advantages you have just by being able to focus on a few key apps? Yes, so, hi, I'm Alessandra again, director of SMU. Uh, for those of you who don't know what SMU does, uh, we're music app companies. We do have different titles, just like you, maybe a little less, about 10. But we decided to focus on our um, you know, best performing three key apps, uh, piano, karaoke, and other app. And what we decided to do, uh, invest our marketing dollars in those three apps and, that's, and then cross promo to the other apps. Um, so we managed to get about 45 million monthly active users to date, um, which has been really impressive. Uh, but we did uh, start the UA uh, from the very beginning. So our major three apps were um, born about two years ago, and we started being really, really heavy on user acquisition. And then together with user acquisition, we got also lucky because um, our apps are quite social, and uh, we started partner, uh, partnering up with artists from all over the world. And so we uh, did get uh, a good wave of virality together with uh, you know, our user acquisition efforts. Um, so 
it is very hard, I think, to concentrate on 20 or 30 different titles. Um, it would require a significant amount of money. Uh, so unless you're, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft or Facebook, you will probably not be able to um, advertise effectively uh, all of them. So my suggestion is to just pick one or two and then perhaps try and cross promo to the other ones or you know, maybe just focus on your, your will. And th that's a great segue into starting, you know, putting your toes into the UA game. How are you guys doing that? I mean, it's so easy as you said to blow a bunch of cash on inefficient channels. UA is the one area where you have to be absolutely ruthless. So what's your strategy right now and how do you see that evolving as you guys ramp up your spend? Yeah, so right, um, so right now as we're, we're, we're dipping our toes in, kind of the strategy is we're looking at our portfolio of games, um, how they perform on a CPM level, if there's any kind of uh, you know, arbitrage that we can basically do with the CPM that we're earning and the CPM that we can spend. Um, and then the other side of it is, um, the LTV's uh, CPI uh, thing. So, with a cool one of the cool things about our our types of games is they're ninety five percent ad revenue. Um, so before I was, I was at a company called Dots. We had this game called Do Dots, uh, launching a new game actually this week called Dots and Co. Check it out, uh, where it's mostly IP revenue, and IP revenue is is more volatile on an ARP DAO basis. With ads revenue, it's actually is pretty consistent. It's got a smaller variance, so it's easier to predict. Anything with a smaller variance is more predictable. So then it's going into like looking at our LTV, what are, what's our ads revenue LTV, and ultimately what will the CPI be to acquire that user, um, and if it's if it's a profitable transaction to keep it on. Okay, what's, what's your take on? And this is a question to both of you on developers who bid in a ROI negative manner. Is there a logic in doing that, and is that a sustainable practice? Yeah, so I think um, that's a awesome, that's an amazing question. Uh, you can find yourself uh, in situations where you know, you're ROI negative, um, particularly around like burst, for example. Um, but uh, yeah, it, you know, it's it's not obviously not sustainable to continue to be ROI negative and lose money, you know, because uh, it's not going to work, right? But um, I think there are are times where like in in marketing where uh, the tipping point, you know, hits and like you hit the saturation point where all of a sudden you've driven this massive awareness, uh, and then yeah, the users that you get in are talking about the game. You're having a higher organic uplift. You're forcing that organic uplift multiplier to go up, right? Especially if you're gaining chart rank, and yeah, like you can turn an ROI negative situation into an ROI positive situation by spending more. It's possible, but I don't think it's sustainable to continue to do that and be our net what and just like burn m money you know I don't, that's not a good idea I, mean, I think it's interesting to your point because a few years ago investors probably they were actually pushing companies to grow uh more than being revenue positive and so i think it will make sense a few years ago because probably was at that point easy to raise money when we were showing your uh, monthly active user growing by 10x every year etc but i think now the trend is reversing uh, and i think it's encouraging there is reversing because it's kind of scary when you invest so much money on companies that they're not profitable um, but it's interesting because I do think there is a balance uh, between you know growing your business growing your MAU but at the same time trying to be ROI positive. Yeah, I love what you said there on this bubble look there is a bubble that's bursting in the tech industry and it's probably the best thing ever because it forces companies to be efficient with how you allocate capital I can't tell you how often companies come to us and say, how much volume can you drive? The CPI doesn't really matter to us. We just want volumes, we just want eyeballs. And that scares me in the seat that I'm in, right? Well, you've got companies spending with us because you worry how sustainable is this practice? And it's so good to see things revert to, I think, a healthy place today. And not just healthy, as I said, ruthless is a term I use to describe the lens you need when you're a UA buyer. You have to be ruthless because if you can arbitrage, and you can spend a dollar and make more than a dollar back, you've got a real business model there. Um, uh, you've been doing UA for some time and you guys have uh, some really interesting strategies. Uh, what I like about uh, Alessandra's approach is most of our customers uh, will just do things the traditional way, but you guys have gone a little bit beyond that and you guys bid in regions, for example, where people would say, I'm not touching that country, there's no way users there are valuable. 
but you guys have managed to see great returns. H how do you do that and what's your philosophy there? Well, so I think the secret really lies in the product. Uh, our main app is a sync karaoke and it does perform really, really well in Asia. And so we decided to be bold and just go out there even though everybody was like, don't touch China just don't bother with Southeast Asia. Um, but we are seeing a great growth uh, with very cheap CPIs and that allow us to buy um, a very high volume installs, very high volume of users who retain and engage very well and at the same time monetize quite well. In fact, uh, you'd be surprised, but our best performing country is Indonesia by far. Uh, and it's been growing 10x faster than the US this year. Why? How? What, what's going on? <laughs> well, I think we are uh, we're social. Uh, we have social apps, and once you try and go to a country and literally, like, uh, or not literally, but conquer it, um, it becomes much easier to um, get PR coverage and get just this word of mouth going. And I think that's what's happening to us in in, in Southeast Asia. Awesome. And talking about travel. My benchmark for whether a conference is good is whether Christians there or not. I've been to like every conference in this industry and I always bump into Christian. Um, you're in Asia, I've seen you there. What, what are you guys doing in Asia and wh what are you seeing? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of growth, especially um, for us in, in China. It was one of our fastest growing markets, but obviously it's getting more difficult to operate there. Um, yeah, I think it's the it's it's interesting because there are a lot of opportunities outside of these saturated markets, especially from a paid growth perspective to, to grow your business. Um, kind of what we look at is where we see uh, CPMs growing. Um, China is an inter interesting market. I want to say particularly, I feel weird saying this because you're sitting here, but uh, the Vungle team in China is incredibly awesome. Um, they have a really strong team there and we've been working with them obviously to uh, increase our awareness there. Um, but I think you're, you're starting to see companies make investments in China, starting to grow um, infrastructure there to, to make business a lot easier and to make it a lot easier to self-publish, which is something that's been incredibly, incredibly difficult, especially for international businesses. Um, so I think it's really good when you have companies like Mungle coming in there, setting up the infrastructure for companies like KetchUp to come in and self-publish our games. Um, so for us, that's incredibly important. Awesome. Now, I want to give each of you a chance to ask each other a question. So, Alessandra, I know, I know your question, but I'll, I'll let you shoot it off to Christian, and then Christian will take a question from you to Alessandra. Okay. Perfect. So that's my question for you. Where do you see the mobile um, app space going and developing in the next three to five years? Yeah, no, um, like in just in general, where, how's this, where is the space going? Um, I think it's, it's getting really, really interesting. So from my perspective, like the tech is getting better. It's like, it's not, it's not actually, it's incredible. Like all of our device, like it's incredible. We're, we make games, right? And the games are so intensive and we're all playing these games on our devices and we can track a lot of different things, a lot of different events. Um, and spend is continuing to pour into mobile. Like spend per user is continuing to go up throughout 2018. So for, for being, you know, a CRO, and, and on the revenue side of the business, that's an awesome thing to look at. Anything, you know, revenue going up and to the right on a producer basis, oh, hell yeah, I'm in the most awesome market ever. Um, and I'm really, really excited about that. Um, and to me, it's, it's gonna be really interesting to see how developers respond, how, how do they incorporate this into the design of their games and then their applications? How do they incorporate these, uh, these new forms of monetization? Um, and how does the industry respond to that? And how do they catch up from a, from a technology perspective? How do they make it easier for us? Um, and how do more dollars come in from other areas, seeing that this is a really lucrative and attractive business to advertise in? Um, it's it's awesome for me because, you know, ads, ads Arp DAO uh, is going to continue to go up for developers. And that just means that we're gonna have we're going to be able to, to market our games more. We're going to be able to do more with more capital, with more money. Um, so I'm really, really excited about that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll chip in there, actually. And this relates to the previous question I asked about China, right? When we went there, I thought it was a volume play. I thought there's a ton of devices, billion devices, 
but there'll be tiny opt-out per user. I was completely wrong. The revenue per user is insane. The CPIs that we see are comparable to the US. But on the technology side, Alessandro, when you asked me the question earlier, I said to you, I think it's, it's all about technology and that uh, anyone familiar with Gabe Layden from Machine Zone? I love that guy. His, he gave a great talk uh, at a panel about the whole world in the future being quantified. And every dollar you spend, whether that's for a toilet paper, which is the example he gave, or whether that's to acquire any type of user, it'll be a closed loop mechanism. You'll be able to quantify every dollar you spend. And I think as a CRO or in the marketing space, that's a dream because every dollar you spend is a dollar you actually get back, if not more. So Christian, what's your question to uh, Alessandra? Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, you've been in, in the UA space for a while. Um, what's your, like, biggest pain point or frustration today, and, and do you see that changing in the future? Yeah, so I think uh, we have many, <laughs> but the, the major ones are, um, and, and we, we kind of touched that point a little bit, uh, the fact that we, as an app company, um, greatly depend on Google and Apple. And so we were discussing with Zane when recently Apple decided to cut their fee from 30% to 15%. Uh, and so suddenly for subscription business, this means that we are getting 15% um, or less, uh, or, or sorry, more revenue on, on the subscription uh, business, which is great and it's amazing. Uh, but at the same time, that made me think, what if Apple tomorrow will wake up and say, oh, instead of 15%, let's revert it back to 30% or maybe 40%. Um, so, th you know, the fact that we really depend so much on these two players, that's really scary. From a user acquisition standpoint, uh, we found great partners like Van Gogh, uh, we have a few others, I see Tapjoy here, um, outside of Facebook and Google, but these two players, they continue to be very important for any single gaming or non-gaming company out there, and uh, we do still depend quite a lot on them, and uh, and that's scary. So we hope that um, you know companies and app networks are outside of uh, these two big players will keep growing. Uh, we're actually seeing great success with you guys um, in Asia, uh, much more than you than we're actually seeing with uh, with Facebook, which is interesting. Uh, and so we hope that you know the space will. Uh, will become more diverse in the near future. I just want to say Zane did not pay us to say nice things about Bungle. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't, but we'll ask later. I'll ask later. <laughs> I find that's people in the room, so that's going to be tough to avoid now. Uh, Christian, same question to you. I mean, that was a great question, Alessandra, and that's coming from a perspective of, you know, you guys have really scaled out your operation. What about you guys, where you are right now then? Yeah, so for me, it's really like I, I want the tech to catch up. Like, I want to be able to do things that I can't do today. And it's, um, and for that to exist, like, the whole industry has to cooperate and has to improve their tech, and everyone has to have stronger communication uh, loops. Um, and I think when, when that happens, it's just going to be better for everyone. So for me, my, my, my greatest pain point is wanting to do something, and I can't do it because uh, the, the whole industry isn't there yet. But I think it is moving in that direction. So it's just like, just kind of waiting for it and waiting for it and waiting for it, um, and I, th you know, and I think I don't know. Maybe when we get there, there's going to be more stuff that we want to do that we can't do yet. Uh, but that's just basic. That's that's uh, my frustration. When you say industry, who who are you referring to, or other um, which segments of the industry need to move the needle and start innovating more? Um, the biggest one right now for me is uh, is mediation. Um, so for me, mediation right now is uh, is still kind of the, the 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 philosophy and the idea is there like yeah we can have like this you you show someone a slide on how mediation works like yeah okay that makes sense but in reality it doesn't really work like that and so um, to me I think there's going to be some huge improvements to mediation over the next 12 months uh, and that's really going to help our business because we're 95 percent we make 95 percent of money from from ad revenue. Um, uh, and not to not to say that, that any of the mediation companies are bad. It's just that this this the space ha hasn't had that many uh, incumbents, uh, f you know, competing against each other. So once you start increasing the competition, new entrants come in. I think the technological innovation is going to start speeding up, and it's going to be a lot better for developers. It's going to be a lot better for ad networks. It's going to be a lot better for the entire ecosystem. 
Yeah, and information asymmetry is the key thing too, right? Making information more transparent. Right. Very difficult uh, for whichever part of the ecosystem you're in if the technology <laughs> doesn't provide that. Uh, Christian's on the uh, supply side too, so you guys monetize with us. Um, what does an advertiser like Smule look for? Let's just assume Smule's advertising in Ketchup, right? What is it you would look for in Ketchup and what, what question would you have for the supply side of the business? I think transparency is definitely number one. Um, and we've been talking about this for a few years. Uh, the industry is definitely getting better, uh, but it's still not there. Um, and I think when you empower a company um, and give transparency, it's actually a win-win on both sides. And I think this is something that um, you know the industry still hasn't fully understood yet. Um, that's probably the major pain point still. It drives me absolutely nuts too. Every year I'm at a panel or I'm on a panel and you hear about transparency, transparency. I actually think there's a conspiracy. I think the ad industry is trying to hide things, right? Um, I mean, we started the company because I was sick of this uh, you know, smoke and mirror game in advertising. I used to be a developer myself and I blew a ton of money, a ton of money on the worst channels possible. Um, I think technology providers are afraid to show their value uh, or rather the platforms themselves are afraid. And w we, we went out there and we started saying, we'll do CPI for video because you'll see exactly what you get. But uh, I also think it's down to the other side of it too, which is the advertising side. A lot of customers aren't buying in a sophisticated way. When you have advertisers who just want views or just want clicks, companies like us are under pressure to build for that buying model. Yeah. And what I'm hoping to see in the industry is a lot more focus on pure ROI and pure data. Any, any comments on that? I mean, 100% agree. Um, it's, it, you know, the advertisers have buying power, obviously, and we, ha we have to do, you know, what, what they want. Um, and if, it's, if they're not spending in, in a smart way or an intelligent way, it's, it's hard for us to respond in an intelligent way, right? So 100% agree. Yeah. I mean, to your point, um, I think transparency goes both ways, right? So when I see a company who is transparent, then I'm willing to give transparency and that will help scaling. So, example, we're willing to give secondary post back on even purchase event, trial events, etc. Um, if I know on the other end, where am I buying, right? I'm buying, I want to make sure that my brand um, out there doesn't end up in, in sites that I don't want to um, that I don't want to be, but at the same time, I'm giving full transparency to um, to the company to really optimize and manage to increase our spend um, in the appropriate place. So, yeah. Awesome. So we have a couple of minutes for questions from the audiences. Feel free to ask any of us a question. Uh, a quick show of hands if you have questions so we can get the microphone towards you. This is a question for Christian. I think you mentioned that you were expecting some uh, important improvements in the mediation space in the next 12 months or so. Where, where do you see are the biggest challenges and things that will, or you think will improve, or what are the biggest changes that you, see, you think are coming? Yes, yeah, so I just want to make sure I got your question correctly. What's, what are the biggest challenges in Asia and where do I see oh, the biggest? Sorry, in mediation. mediation. Oh, in mediation? Sorry. Yeah. So, um, so in theory, like, the, like mediation should work the way everyone says it's going to work, right? But in reality, it's, that's not how it works. And it's because there's, there's lags in, in reporting and, and the, the technology isn't there yet. The algorithms are biased. We have some mediation partners that plug in their own demand. Uh, the revenue models are different. So there are all these different companies that, that are competing and they're trying to make, and it's, and it's a hard business, right? Mediation companies are operating on very low uh, profit margins, right? The, they're very small. So in order for them to be profitable, they have to scale, right? Um, and to be honest, the, the tech for mediation to work the way everyone wants, to, wa wants it to work isn't there. And when it does, when it does happen, what we're going to see is CPMs are going to go up for everyone because the way it should work is you should make an instant call, right, to the, the, to the network that wants to serve an impression, and the highest CPM impression should be served. And that should all be done in real time. But it's not done in real time, and it's done through learning algorithms, and a lot of these algorithms aren't there yet. So I think it's, I think one, we have to provide the mediation partners with more information faster. Two, we have to figure out how to remove bias and how to make their revenue model 
uh, be, be fair, basically, to work with developers, right? Not for them to plug in their own demand. Uh, or if they do, for them to provide a lot of value by aggregating demand or doing something else. And then, um, and I think, I think that's, and then three, I think it's like the, the algorithms, like they, they have to improve and they have to continue to, to and that's gonna take time. So I think those are the three biggest things that we need to, to the mediation partners need to do. Um, and when they do it, I think it's gonna help developers get higher CPMs, it's gonna help advertisers advertise where they want to and get more conversions, and ad networks are also gonna make more money. Um, so I think, and the mediation partners will probably make more money too. So I think once we, we can all get on board with this, then it'll be a lot better for everyone. Okay, we have a, a couple more minutes, so uh, I'm gonna throw some questions out there too. Uh, let's go back to the theme of data and transparency. Um, what Alessandra talked about with post-event optimization really means sending data back to the platform that delivers the users and giving complete transparency into what every single user does. Whether that's the user opening the app, whether that's a user uh, spending money inside of the app. That's uh, a lot of data there. What are some of the cultural hurdles that you had to overcome and you've seen other developers overcome with sharing that data? Because a lot of developers see that as their data and that's the holy grail, but you know, if we're transparent with that data, we can, we can all act on that data and get lookalike users. Totally, yes, and uh, so I think there are t two points in this. Uh, usually, UA teams uh, tend to be very lean, and uh, especially when it comes to gaming companies, they used to spend, I mean, we spend millions of dollars every month, and we usually run with a team of four or five people. Um, and so it's really hard for your in-house team to really optimize every single network that you're running with for every single title that you have in every single country. So if you are, if you trust your partner and you do decide to share data and they decide to share data back, they can also help you optimize uh, those little campaigns that your internal team does really not have time um, to go and optimize. And so I think for a few key partners that we do have, Vango is definitely one of, of them, um, we do have a you know weekly relationship with this team and they do help actively optimize our campaigns for ROI or cost per subscri subscription basis then obviously on the other hand if you don't give me transparency and I do share data with you and you just collect the data and you don't do anything with it you just look for your CPM ICPMs or high click through rate then uh, there is no uh, you know, real value into sharing this data. Great, and concluding remarks, as we have uh, just two minutes left, uh, what advice do you have for someone like Christian, who is, you've got a ton of experience with UA, but you know, you're just starting out on the UA side for a catch up. What advice do you have for Christian and other folks in Christian's position? Because you know, you've scaled UA, you're a huge UA buyer, and you've got all the, you know, who the right vendors are, you know, how to measure LTV. So what's the key advice you have for everyone in the room? So I think UA is relatively easy because you can measure everything. Well, much easier than make a case for spending money on branding, for example, right? Uh, because you can measure everything. So the way we work as Mule is, um, and I always, uh, you know, um, I laugh a lot about it because we look at uh, the famous 3x margins, which I think um, all of you in the US look at the 3x margins from the investor. I always joke that in Italy we would be good with 1.1x, <laughs> uh, but uh, it always comes to that and then you can walk back and really understand, okay, so what from my ROI after three years, what's my ROI after seven days should look like to get that 3x after three years and then how much money uh, can I spend in order to get this first ROI one or ROI seven and then uh, you know, ROI three years and then it would be very easy to do the math and be okay, this is how much money I can spend and this is how much money we're gonna get back in three years from now. If this were a pal in New York and the brand world heard you say UA is e easy, they would like vomit. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is great. I think this comes down to the fact that both of you guys have built a solid product. You've got an economic engine that converts. That's why UA is easy because if you get users in, you've got the engine to monetize. Christian, last comment from you. Um, what, ad what, what advice do you have and what mistakes can people avoid as they start to uh, scale their UA campaigns? And you know, what, what have you learned as you've started embarking on scaling up UA? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, learn as much as you can. Ask as many, many, as many questions as you can in the very beginning, and just do diligence and and try to learn, like so you can scale, so you can build these models. Talk to your partners um, before you make any like decisions. Uh, for because you're, uh, for me that was like the best possible thing. When I started first getting into UI, I had no idea what I was jumping into. Um, and then as I start to learn, you can, you can pick it up. Um, it becomes a lot easier, as, 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 as we mentioned. Uh, but don't, never stop learning. And even when you think you know everything, like in, it's, something's going to change. So just continue to, to try to learn. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. We're going to stay behind uh, if you want to come up to us and ask any questions. Thank you.